Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Interim Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Neil Harris, the Preston and Sterling Morton Professor Emeritus of History and Art History at the University of Chicago. His interests lie in the evolution of American cultural life, high, popular, and mass, and more particularly on the formation and sustenance of its supporting institutions. Harris has special concerns with the histories of museums and libraries, the social history of art and design, the character of art collecting, the nature of metropolitan life, the design and of consumption and shopping experiences, and the relationship between people and the built landscape. Harris's latest book, Capital Culture, J. Carter Brown, The National Gallery of Art, and the Reinvention of the Museum Experience, was the subject of a lecture he gave at the University of Oregon on Monday, May 5, 2014. He was a guest of the Department of the History of Art and Architecture. Thanks for being with us today. It's a pleasure. Who was J. Carter Brown? Well, J. Carter Brown was a very interesting figure. Um, I think of him as young because he had a, a very early career. Um, he was a scion of a great Rhode Island family. Brown University was one of the uh, uh, achievements of the Browns. And he grew up in Providence, Newport, went to Harvard College, uh, spent a wander year abroad, um, got some advanced degrees, and at a very young age, he, be, he joined the staff of the National Gallery in Washington. And eight years later, he became its director. So he's what, 30? He was born in 34, so he's about um, 35 when he became the director of the National Gallery. Uh, a meteoric rise, but he was in fact um, a prince in waiting. His father was an extraordinary figure himself, a man named John Nicholas Brown, one of the Monuments Men. It's a subject that um, Hollywood has made familiar, I think, in the last few months. He himself was an art historian, and he probably would have become an art historian or an architect, except that he inherited a fortune of about a hundred million dollars early in the 20th century, and that has a way of deflecting away from <laughs> professional goals. I understand that uh, J. Carter Brown's father, when he was uh, a child, was referred to as the richest baby in America. Yes. Uh, oh, sometimes they said in the world. Of course, it's like all World Series. Um, any source of comparison is okay. His father and his uncle died within either weeks or months of one another, and the money all devolved upon him, held in trust, by his mother, who was a formidable figure. He was born in New York, but under a Rhode Island flag that was placed in the room so that his affiliation <laughs> would be guaranteed. <laughs> anyway, this was the family. It was a very talented family. Um, Carter's mother was herself quite a formidable uh, figure. Uh, she was um, a journalist. She was um, the first professional publicist in the history of tennis. She was a violinist, um, and she emerged as a rather formidable uh, doyen of uh, Newport and Providence society in later years. So why is J. Carter Brown worthy of a book length? study? Well, um, because I think he was one of the two or three most significant um, museum directors in America for the last third of the 20th century and set a style in museum management and policy that became extraordinarily influential. The National Gallery is, many uh, of your uh, viewers may know, is a relatively young museum. It was opened in 1941, uh, very late as far as great international museums are concerned, but it emerged um, like Athena from the forehead of Zeus, fully formed. It had great masterpieces. But it became, um, for a period of years, a slightly sleepy place that was content to rely on its extraordinary collection. It didn't do much in the way of temporary or visiting exhibitions. That is, until Brown got there, and in the eight years that he served under John Walker, who was the director at the time, he moved up the um, ropes, as it were, learned his trade, and decided, I think, uh, quite self-consciously to bring drama and excitement to the gallery. And the principal way he did that was through blockbuster exhibitions. And the blockbuster exhibition 
as we now know it, or as we recognize the term, really was born in the 1970s. It was <coughs> born um, principally because of two people, Carter Brown and Tom Hoving, who is his uh, arch rival and the director of the Metropolitan in New York. So it's <coughs> really um, Carter Brown's attention to these extraordinary exhibitions, his cultivation of them, and creation of a style which I think made him a figure of such importance. He was also charismatic and magnetic. So for all of these reasons, uh, it seemed to me that uh, it was uh, appropriate to uh, write a book about him. You say in the introduction uh, to the book that it, you it's, it's an institutional biography. Yes. What do you mean by that term? Well, as I, uh, I've been a historian or a professional historian now for almost half a century, one of the areas that is most challenging to write about is the history of organizations, universities, museums, hospitals. How, in fact, do you tell this story without putting a reader to sleep inside of about a minute and a half? <laughs> it's really like looking at someone else's family history. And in my opinion, one way to do it is to try to organize the institution's history around the personality, the policies, the temperament of its leadership. And I do think that institutional leadership makes a difference for specific institutions. So institutional biography was a way of suggesting I didn't want to write a biography about Carter Brown, who was a complex figure. It's still relatively soon after his death. I wanted to write a story which explained why that institution had changed because of him. So institutional biography is the phrase that I applied. The, the uh, short title of the book is um, Capital Culture. Is there a double entendre in that title? At least. Uh, <laughs> at least <laughs> could I'm you, hoping that it Could you gloss it for us? Well, um, the, all of the events I'm describing took place at a time when Washington uh, declared itself the uh, capital of the free world. And uh, there was an effort um, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s during the Cold War uh, to try to increase the assets, the cultural assets, of the capital city. Of course, capital culture is also a reference to the fact that culture is capital uh, when you are uh, dealing with some of its manifestations. This is a period the period I'm talking about, of enormous federal growth and ambition. And I spend several chapters in this book talking about S. Dillon Ripley, who was the secretary of Smithsonian at just about the same time. This is the era that gives us the creation of the National Endowments, for example, and of the Kennedy Center. Washington um, becomes a, a cultural capital in ways that it had never been before. And cultural capital is also used by the politicians in Washington who entertain their constituents and who basically want to show them, if they can, some of them at least, where their money is going. And the visits, and I talk a little bit about the growth of tourism in Washington and how tourism and political influence operate in a kind of world where it's hard to separate the boundaries. Uh, Carter and Dylan Ripley played upon this. It was a period of expansion. New museums were built of great size and magnificence during this period, some supported by private donations, but others uh, requiring, all of them in fact, requiring the support of Congress for their actual maintenance. So capital culture is about the alliance, if you will, between the political establishment and cultural capital. So you just mentioned the uh, growth in buildings, uh, institutional <coughs> buildings. Um, tell us about the um, Brown's role in the addition of the East Building of the National Gallery. Well, his role in the planning uh, of the East Building was fundamental and really was the uh, key to his appointment as director because he began working on it in about 1967 or so when he was assisting John Walker. And Paul Mellon, who is the crucial figure on the board of the National Gallery, the very small board of the National Gallery, uh, realized that he was the person uh, to bring the gallery building to completion. The East Building 
came about because of a gift from Paul Mellon, who is the founder's son, Andrew Mellon's son, and his sister, $20 million uh, in the 1960s toward a building that would cost them eventually about $120 million. Uh, there were cost increases of all sorts. Carter began to plan it and supervised its construction. It opened in 1978, about 10 years after the gift was announced. He was um, partly responsible for the choice of I.M. Pei, who was the building architect. And the East Building, which is not an uncontroversial building, was a product of his and Pei's ideas, I think. And uh, visitors who have been to Washington will know something of this building, which really, um, I think, changed the course of modern architecture in Washington. Can you say a little bit more about that more specifically? Well, the, I think the key thing, the East Building, for those who haven't been there, is an enormous atrium. And at its corners, it has various uh, galleries, in some cases, uh, several stories high. But most people, I think, when they think of the building, will think of this great central space with a Calder mobile hanging in the middle and various other um, important modern artists represented in works commissioned for the structure. It's quite arresting. It's done of marble, uh, but it is not a temple-like building, which the old East Building, mm -hmm. uh, which the old West Building was. Um, and some architectural historians and museum um, people have complained that the hanging space, if you will, the exhibition galleries, are not really up to the um, grandeur and significance of the structure itself. Pei, who built a number of museums, including the Louvre Pyramid, mm -hmm. was um, beginning to develop something which we also associate with Carter Brown, user-friendly buildings, buildings that could host great events. Uh, and the dinners in the East Building for special occasions were quite magnificent. But this was, again, part of a trend of museums to compete with other entertainment venues at the same time. So um, the East Building can be said to mark a climax, in, and it hasn't, I shouldn't say a climax, I guess it continues to evolve museum structures that appear to be built around social activities mm -hmm. rather than the simple needs for displaying art. So you've already spoken a little bit about uh, Brown's role in, in um, the phenomenon of the blockbuster show. So what's the first major show that Brown is involved with that, that really starts this trend? Well, I think the show that um, he perhaps is most identified with, along with Tom Hoving, is a show of uh, about 1976, although it tours for several years, called The Treasures of Tutankhamun. And King Tut, in various forms, visits America a number of times in the 20th century. But this was a show <coughs> that really created the parameters of the blockbuster. It had enormous crowds attached to it, um, lots and lots of merchandising. The gift shops were also flowering in this period. Hoving was in charge, in fact, of the merchandising, which was meant to return some of the royalties to Egypt to permit them to uh, modernize their museum where the relics of Tut were kept. Uh, it also used Ticketron, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. um, the crush was so great. And uh, at many museums, uh, the pressure to get in was so strong that people bought memberships in order to get into the show at, at some reasonable time limit. There were long lines around museums, and it toured the United States. It took about two years or so for it to fulfill all of its um, obligations. I, there was a Tut craze, not the first Tut craze, but still a powerful one. Some may remember Steve Martin uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, King Tut on Saturday Night Live. In any event, the excitement, uh, the crowds, the advertising, the organization of the museum, again, to handle these masses. These were like movie premieres, and they had the glamour attached to uh, American popular entertainment. Um, that's what made Tut, I think, so significant uh, an event. It was also significant because it was the first major uh, exhibition to fall under a recent piece of congressional legislation, which was an indemnification act. 
Um, Congress passed in the 1970s an act which made the government the insurer of last resort. These things were priceless, of course, and there was a crisis because museums couldn't afford the insurance premiums. The indemnification program, which is still going, they have ex you have to apply for it, and they've extended the limits. But without that program, it would be impossible to conceive some of the great shows which have come to the United States. And at that point, it was only foreign uh, materials that were being insured. So all of these made Tut iconic, and its vulgarization also made it iconic because people began to worry about the limits to uh, the promotion and the merchandising of the shows themselves. I know um, an extension of this phenomenon, um, which Carter is one of the initiators of, is um, the Guggenheim Museum on, under Tom Krenz. And I'm thinking in particular of opening a gallery in uh, a Las Vegas um, yes, casino uh, yeah. and, um, and having a show of motorcycles there. And this is a sort of ultimate extension of this kind of vulgarization, yes? Well, there, there are arguments about I mean, the mm -hmm. motorcycle show. I think there was one in the Guggenheim itself. Yes, and I, I gather on, on the ramps made it uh, mm -hmm. particularly enticing. Um, it, was, um, it was about, again, the um, dramatization uh, of uh, temporary shows, which some critics argued uh, took away from the value of the permanent collection and the reasons that museums were there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an argument which has no uh, final answer. Carter Brown himself presided over uh, a very um, elaborate Department of Installation and Design headed by someone named Guyard Ravenel, Gil Ravenel, who was a genius at creating uh, designs and installations that uh, were enticing and exciting to people, that told a story. And until really the 60s and 70s, museum installation was not something that people paid a lot of attention to. So you mentioned to me before we began speaking um, about um, Brown's last show. And the, tell us how that show um, illuminates the role that diplomacy played in this process. Well, much to the consternation of New Yorkers, uh, Carter uh, exploited uh, the uh, presence in Washington of Congress and the presidency and uh, the ambassadors to bring off these uh, extraordinary loans, trophy loans, that were fundamental to the shows. His last national gallery, great national gallery show, uh, was called Circa 1492, and it was meant to illuminate the art of the world in 1492 at the time of the Columbian voyage. Uh, to do this, he had to get things from Italy, uh, from Spain, uh, from Portugal, even from Poland, uh, to uh, make the show uh, the kind of blockbuster he wanted. It was only to appear in Washington, and all National Gallery shows at this point, even when they went elsewhere, opened in Washington. That was their, um, the seigneurial right that uh, was sustained. To accomplish this, Carter exploited all his connections. He drew on cabinet members, ambassadors, uh, presidents of various countries, and in the case of the Circa 1492 show, he hoped indeed to draw uh, the Pope, uh, the recently canonized Pope, uh, into his orbit as well. And when I was researching the book in the archives of the National Gallery, I found a letter in which he appealed to the Pope to help him get a Leonardo from Poland. But as I said to you earlier, no record of the Pope's response is in the archive. <laughs> You, we've, we've been speaking about um, the transformation of American art museums, art exhibition and art consumption, but among your many areas of expertise is also the role of the artist in American society. How has the role of the artist changed? Well, that's a vast subject, of course. Uh, in the case of the National Gallery, I think, um, when the National Gallery was created, um, no picture or piece of sculpture could be admitted until its creator had been dead for 20 years, which obviously put something of a damper on its ability to collect contemporary art. 
I think um, what's interesting to me is the rapidity with which contemporary artists enter collections mm -hmm. and their deep involvement, despite the fact that some artists are unhappy about museums, institutionalized museums, they're, they are quite complicit, I think, in a culture that involves uh, prices, um, artworks, exhibitions, permanent collections, dealers, all of them um, operating in a kind of universe that has its own laws. <laughs> You've just described uh, very nicely what the universe of American art is like. How is it different from the universe of European institutions and European art collecting? Is it, is it the same? Is it, is it similar there or is it different? Well, I know much less about the European museums. I've not really studied uh, their history or their operation. I think that globalization uh, is um, present in uh, the world uh, of European museums as well. And of course, there you have government involved in the purchase of artworks through various programs, whether it's the lottery or, or whether it's uh, just simply um, uh, giving uh, subventions to museums. In the case of the National Gallery, all of its art is purchased through private funds. No public monies have been expended upon anything there, which um, again uh, makes it a somewhat different mm -hmm. relationship. Tell us a little bit about Carter Brown's influence on um, DC cultural life aside from his work in the National Gallery. Well, he becomes a great partisan for Washington itself. Uh, again, like uh, many people of this sort, uh, everything around him has to be as important as as the person making the promotion. He was chairman of something called the Fine Arts Commission in Washington for more than 30 years. The only chair who lasted that long, this was something set up in the early 20th century and designed to provide controls on Washington's physical character. Washington is a city unlike any other. It has strong restrictions on building height, it, it operates uh, from a plan that was created by Pierre L'Enfant a couple of centuries ago. And Carter becomes, uh, in effect, he was an architectural buff. He was also the chairman of the Pritzker Prize jury. Um, he becomes the chairman of this commission, which sits on a whole range of structures uh, making recommendations. And most notably, he was involved in the Vietnam Memorial. Uh, he was a defender of the Myelin design. And I think without his support and his prestige by this point, it's difficult to see how that really would have been constructed. You study American cultural life broadly. Um, we've, could you say something about how that, more broadly, the relationship of the story that we've just been talking about relates to the broader transformation of American cultural life. Well, that's a, um, that's a heady uh, set of issues. I think that museums are part of a series of um, entertainment outposts which have been struggling with what one might call mediated culture mm -hmm. in uh, the last few decades. Um, and the museum is a place to come to, to actually see things, although they are using electronics uh, extensively, some might say unmercifully, uh, in efforts to promote their own being. I think we're seeing something being worked out now whose end we cannot um, yet imagine. The uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York is recording over six million visitors a year uh, at a time, again, when um, electronic transmission uh, on the web uh, I of all of their masterpieces is, is available. People still want to come to these shrine-like operations. So in a way, you could see this as a, a kind of stage in a long, I don't want to call it a warfare, but uh, tension between, um, if you will, religious and secular. I see the museum as a kind of religious institution. Mm -hmm. um, uh, tastes and uh, museums are going to be important places for some time to come. It's interesting to look at them in relation to libraries, mm. which some people find uh, are facing a very different kind of future. Um, so, 
it, it's almost impossible to summarize the place of the art museum in this larger world of culture, but it seems to be th thriving in ways that perhaps were unanticipated a few decades ago. Especially given that the prices in places like the Metropolitan are it's astonishingly high prices. Yes, but cheaper than a hockey game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that perspective, that context. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, tell us about the direction your research is currently taking. So you've completed this significant work. It's 500 pages, 600 mm -hmm. pages long. What, what, what do you do next? Well, uh, at the moment, uh, my wife and I, and my wife is a, uh, an art historian and a museum administrator, I've organized a show. It's a very different kind of show. I like to move from specific project to specific project. Um, it's a show on French illustration in World War I, mm. which is opening to mark the centenary of the war's outbreak next fall at the University of Chicago Library. Uh, and this is uh, a show about uh, books and graphic artists and illustrations uh, which were created during the war in France uh, by a set of artists who are obscure even there. Um, and uh, my, uh, uh, my collecting history, now our collecting history, um, often is uh, built around obscure figures because that's all we could afford. Uh, and sometimes obscure figures become better known. <laughs> in any event, uh, that's something that uh, I've been uh, working on. I've also been involved with um, a larger project um, which is examining Art Deco um, design in Chicago. Uh, Chicago uh, is an art city uh, like Los Angeles, which may be said to have suffered under benign neglect for some years because of the dominance of New York. So this is a kind of variation, if you will, on the Washington New, New York story. Uh, but um, I'm interested in the history of uh, commercial graphic art in particular, so we're planning um, a catalog and an exhibition which we hope will take place sometime in the next few years. Well, we look forward to both of those shows, the World War I, especially timely. Um, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I've been speaking with Neil Harris, the Preston and Sterling Morton Professor Emeritus of History and Art History at the University of Chicago. His latest book, Capital Culture, J. Carter Brown, The National Gallery of Art and the Reinvention of the Museum Experience, was the subject of a lecture he gave at the University of Oregon on Monday, May 5, 2014. He was the guest of the Department of the, of the History of Art and Architecture. Join me next time when I speak with Bill Cheng. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>